Hello, thank you for joining me today. We're reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text, and we are on chapter 17, section five. So I hope that we'll be able to finish this chapter in one reading. We've got sections five through eight to complete today. So chapter 17 in A Course in Miracles is forgiveness and the holy relationship. Oh, and just a reminder, if you've missed uh, any of the other messages, uh, I've had some dental work done, and so I'm going to be off camera for a couple of uh, weeks. But I, I hope that I can read well enough that we can continue this process. So chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, section five, The Healed Relationship. The holy relationship is the expression of the holy instant in living in this world. Like everything about salvation, the holy instant is a practical device witnessed by its results. The holy instant never fails. The experience of it is always felt, yet without expression it is not remembered. The holy relationship is a constant reminder of the experience in which the relationship become, became what it is. And as the holy the unholy relationship is a continuing hymn of hate in praise of its maker, so is the holy relationship a happy song of praise to the redeemer of relationships. The holy relationship, a major step toward the perception of the real world, is learned. It is the old, unholy relationship transformed and seen anew. The holy relationship is a phenomenal teaching accomplishment. In all its aspects, as it begins, develops, and becomes accomplished, it represents the reversal of the unholy relationship. Be comforted in this. The only difficult phase is the beginning. For here, the goal of the relationship is abruptly shifted to the exact opposite of what it was. This is the result of offering the relationship to the Holy Spirit for his purposes. This invitation is accepted immediately and the Holy Spirit wastes no time in introducing the practical results of asking him to enter. At once his goal replaces yours. This is accomplished very rapidly but it makes the relationship seem disturbed, disjunctive, and even quite distressing. The reason is quite clear, for the relationship as it is, is out of line with its own goal and clearly unsuited to the purpose that it has been accepted for. In its unholy condition, your goal was all that seemed to give it meaning. Now it seems to make no sense. Many relationships have been broken off at this point, and the pursuit of the goal, old goal reestablished in another relationship. For once the unholy relationship has accepted the goal of holiness, it can never again be what it was. The temptation of the ego becomes extremely intense with this shift in goals for the relationship has not yet been changed sufficiently to make its former goal completely without attraction, and its structure is threatened by the recognition of its inappropriateness for meeting its new purpose. The conflict between the goal and the structure of the relationship is so apparent they cannot coexist. Yet now, the goal will not be changed. Set firmly in the unholy relationship, there is no course except to change the relationship to fit the goal. Until this happy solution is seen and accepted as the only way out of the conflict, the relationship may seem to be severely strained. It would not be kinder to shift the goal more slowly, for the contrast would be obscured and the ego, given time to reinterpret each slow step according to its liking. 
Only a radical shift in purpose could induce a complete change of mind about what the whole relationship is for. As this change develops and it is firmly finally accomplished, it grows increase, increasingly beneficent and joyous. But at the beginning, the situation is experienced as very precarious. A relationship undertaken by two individuals for their unholy purposes suddenly has holiness as its goal. As these two contemplate their relationship from the point of view of this new purpose, they are inevitably appalled. Their perception of the relationship may even become quite disorganized. And yet the former organization of their perception no longer serves the purpose they have agreed to meet. This is the time for faith. You let this goal be set for you. That was an act of faith. Do not abandon faith now that the rewards of faith are being introduced. If you believed that the Holy Spirit was there to accept the relationship, why would you now not still believe that he is there to purify what he has taken under his guidance? Have faith in your brother in what but seems to be a trying time. The goal is set, and your relationship has sanity as its purpose. For now you find yourself in an insane relationship, recognized as such in the light of its goal. Now the ego counsels thus, substitute for this another relationship to which your former goal was quite appropriate. You can escape from your distress only by getting rid of your brother. You need not part entirely if you choose not to do so, but you must exclude major areas of fantasy from each other to save your sanity. Hear not this now. Have faith in him who answered you. He heard. Has he not been very explicit in his answer? You are not now wholly insane. Can you deny that he has given you a most explicit statement? Now he asks for faith a little longer, even in bewilderment. For this will go, and you will see the justification for your faith emerge, to bring you shining conviction. Abandon him not now, nor one another. This relationship has been reborn as holy. Accept with gladness what you do not understand, and let it be explained to you as you perceive its purpose work in it to make it holy. You will find many opportunities to blame your brother for the failure of your relationship, for it will seem at times to have no purpose. A sense of aimlessness will come to haunt you and remind you of all the ways you once sought for satisfaction and thought you found it. Forget not now the misery you really found and do not breathe into life into your failing ego. For your relationship has not been disrupted, it has been saved. You are very new in the ways of salvation and think you have lost your way. Your way is lost, but think not this is loss. In your newness, remember that you have started again together. Take each other's hand to walk together along a road far more familiar than you now believe. Is it not certain that you will remember a goal unchanged throughout eternity? For you have chosen but the goal of God, from which your true intent was never absent. Throughout the sonship is the song of freedom heard in joyous echo of your choice. You have joined with many in the holy instant, and they have joined with you. Think not your choice will leave you comfortless, for God himself has blessed your holy relationship. Join in his blessing and withhold not upon yours. For all it needs now is your blessing, that you may see that it is, that in it rests salvation. 
condemn salvation not, for it has come to you, and welcome it together, for it has come to join you together in a relationship in which all the sonship is together blessed. You undertook together to invite the Holy Spirit into your relationship. He could not have entered otherwise. Although you may have made many mistakes since then, you have also made enormous efforts to help him do his work. And has he not been lacking in appreciation for all you have done for him? Nor does he see the mistakes at all. Have you been similarly grateful to your brother? Have you consistently appreciated the good efforts and overlooked mistakes? Or has your appreciation flickered and grown dim in what seemed to be the light of mistakes? Perhaps you are now entering upon a campaign to blame him for the discomfort of the situation in which you find yourself. And by this lack of thanks, and gratitude, you make yourself unable to express the holy instant and lose sight of it. The experience of an instant, however compelling it may be, is easily forgotten if you allow time to close over it. It must be kept shining and gracious in your awareness of time, but not concealed within it. The instant remains. But where are you? To give thanks to one another is to appreciate the holy instant and thus enable its results to be accepted and shared. To attack your brother is not to lose the instant, but to make it powerless in its effects. You have received the holy instant, but you may have established a condition in which you cannot use it. As a result, you do not realize that it is still with you. And by cutting yourself off from its expression, you have denied yourself its benefit. You reinforce this every time you attack your brother, for the attack must bind you to yourself. And it is impossible to deny yourself and to recognize what has been given and received by you. You and your brother stand together in the holy presence of truth itself. Here is the goal together with you. Think you not the goal itself will gladly arrange the means for its accomplishment? It is this. It is just this same discrepancy between the purpose that has been accepted and the means as they stand now, which seems to make you suffer, but which makes heaven glad. If heaven were outside of you, you could not share in its gladness. Yet because it is within, the gladness too is yours. You are joined in purpose, but remain still separate and divided on the means. Yet the goal is fixed, firm and unalterable, and the means will surely fall in place because the goal is sure and you will share the gladness of the sonship that it is so. As you begin to recognize and accept the gifts you have so freely given to your brother, you will also accept the effects of the holy instant and use them to correct all your mistakes and free you from their results. And learning this, you will have also learned how to release all the sonship and offer it in gladness and thanksgiving to him who gave you your release and who would extend it through you. Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, Section 6, Setting the Goal. The practical application of the Holy Spirit's purpose is extremely simple, but it is unequivocal. In fact, in order to be simple, it must be unequivocal. The simple is merely what is understood, and for this it is apparent that it must be clear. The setting of the Holy Spirit's goal is general. Now he will work with you to make it specific. 
there are certain very specific guidelines he prov provides for any situation. But remember that you do not yet realize their universal application. Therefore, it is essential at this point to use them in each situation separately until you can more safely look beyond each situation in an understanding far broader process than you now possess. In any situation in which you are uncertain, the first thing to consider very simply is, what do I want to come of this? What is it for? The clarification of the goal belongs at the beginning, for it is this which will determine the outcome. In the ego's procedure, this is reversed. The situation becomes the determiner of the outcome, which can be anything. The reason for this disorganized approach is evident. The ego does not know what it wants to come of the situation. It is aware of what it does not want, but only that. It has no positive goal at all. See, I think that's a very interesting point that we should not let uh, uh, go by without note. The ego is aware of what it does not want and only that. It has no positive goal at all. And that is really super important to remember. And the reason for that is that your ego, as we have talked about in other uh, recordings, your ego, and we're not talking about Freud's ego here, we're talking about the ego of the body, which is not the personality ego, it is the, the root chakra ego. The root chakra is the seat of your ego for your physical housing. And that ego is the one that is in charge of your survival. And so it is the things uh, made up of uh, freeze, fight, and flight. Uh, and it does contain the psychological aspects of the ego that Freud talked about. But, um, but Freud never really understood, I don't believe, the ego uh, in its whole. He understood the personality of it, but not the functioning chakra part of it. So I just wanted to highlight that because it's really important to realize that your soul and spirit are the ones that have the positive goal and your ego just knows what it doesn't like and tries to protect you from all things that it doesn't like. Very, very different uh, functions. Okay, continuing on. Without a clear-cut positive goal set at the onset or outset, the situation just seems to happen and makes no sense until it has already happened. Then you look back at it and you try to piece together what it must have meant. And you will be wrong. Not only is your judgment in the past, but you have no idea what should happen. No goal is set with which to bring the means to, in line. And now the only judgment left to make is whether or not the ego likes it. Is it acceptable? Does it call for vengeance? The absence of a criterion for outcomes set in advance makes understanding doubtful and evaluation impossible. The value of deciding in advance what you want to happen is simply that you will perceive the situation as a means to make it happen. You will therefore make every attempt to over, overlook what interferes with the accomplishment of your objective and concentrate on everything that helps you meet it. It is quite noticeable that this approach has brought you closer to the Holy Spirit's sorting out of truth and falsity. The truth becomes what can be used to meet the goal. The false becomes the useless from this point of view. The situation now has meaning, but only because the goal has made it meaningful. The goal of truth has further practical advantages. 
If the situation is used for truth and sanity, its outcome must be peace. And this is quite apart from the outcome, what the outcome is. If peace is the condition of truth and sanity and cannot be without them, where peace is, they must be. Truth comes of itself. If you experience peace, it is because the truth has come to you and you will see the outcome truly, for deception cannot prevail against you. You will recognize the outcome because you are at peace. Here again, you see the opposite of the ego's way of looking, for the ego believes the situation brings the experience. The Holy Spirit knows that the situation is as the goal determines it and is experienced according to the goal. The goal of truth requires faith. Faith is implicit in the acceptance of the Holy Spirit's purpose, and this faith is all-inclusive. Where the goal of truth is set, there must be, their faith must be. The Holy Spirit sees the situation as whole. The goal establishes the fact that everyone involved in it will play his part in its accomplishment. This is inevitable. No one will fail in anything. This seems to ask for faith beyond you and beyond what you can give. Yet this is so only from the viewpoint of the ego, for the ego believes in solving conflict through fragmentation and does not perceive the situation as a whole. Therefore, it seeks to split off segments of the situation and deal with them separately, for it has faith in separation and not in wholeness. Confronted with any aspect of the situation that seems to be difficult, the ego will attempt to take this aspect elsewhere and resolve it there. And it will seem to be successful except that this attempt conflicts with unity and must obscure the goal of truth. And peace will not be experienced except in fantasy. Truth has not come because faith has been denied being withheld from where it rightfully belonged. Thus do you lose the understanding of the situation the goal of truth would bring, for fantasy solutions bring out the illusion of experience, and the illusion of peace is not the condition in which truth can enter. Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, Section 7, The Call for Faith. The substitutes for aspects of the situation are the witnesses to your lack of faith. They demonstrate that you did not believe the situation and problem were the same. The problem was the lack of faith, and it is this you demonstrate when you remove it from its source and place it elsewhere. As a result, you do not see the problem. Had you not lacked faith that it could be solved, the problem would be gone, and the situation would have been meaningful to you because of the inference in the way of understanding that would have been removed. To seek the problem elsewhere is to keep it, for you remove yourself from it and make it unsolvable. There is no problem in any situation that faith will not solve. There is no shift in any aspect of the problem, but will make solution impossible. For if you shift part of the solution, rather, I'm sorry, for if you shift part of the problem elsewhere, the meaning of the problem must be lost, and the solution to the problem is inherent in its meaning. Is it not possible that all your problems have been solved, but you have removed yourself from the solution? Yet faith must be where something has been done and where you see it done. A situation is a relationship bringing the joining of thoughts. If problems are perceived, it is because the thoughts are judged to be in conflict. But if the goal is truth, this is impossible. 
some ideas of bodies have entered, for minds cannot attack. The thought of bodies is the sign of faithlessness, for bodies cannot solve anything. It is their intrusion on the relationship, an error in your thoughts about the isolation, which then becomes justification for your lack of faith. You will make this error, but be not at all concerned with that. The error does not matter. Faithlessness brought to faith will never interfere with truth. But faithlessness used against truth will always destroy faith. If you lack faith, ask that it be restored where it was lost, and seek not to have it made up to you elsewhere as if you had been unjustly deprived of it. Only what you have not given can be lacking in any situation. But remember this. The goal of holiness was set for your relationship and not by you. You did not set it because holiness cannot be seen except through faith, and your relationship was not holy because your faith in your brother was so limited and little. Your faith must grow to meet the goal that has been set. The goal's reality will call this forth, for you will see that peace and faith will not come separately. What situation can you be in without faith and remain faithful to your brother? Every situation in which you find yourself is but a means to meet the purpose set for your relationship. See it as something else and you are faithless. Use not your faithlessness. Let it enter and look upon it calmly, but do not use it. Faithlessness is the servant of illusion and wholly faithful to its master. Use it and it will carry you straight to illusions. Be tempted not by what it offers you. It interferes not with the goal, but with the value of the goal to you. Accept not the illusion of peace it offers, but look upon its offering and recognize it is illusion. The goal of illusion is closely tied to faithlessness as faith to truth. If you lack faith in anyone to fulfill, and perfectly, his part in any situation dedicated in advance to truth, your dedication is divided. And so you have been faithless to your brother and used your faithlessness against him. No relationship is holy unless its holiness goes with it everywhere. As holiness and faith go hand in hand, so must its faith go everywhere with it. The goal's reality will call forth and accomplish every miracle needed for its fulfillment. Nothing too small or too enormous, too weak or too compelling, but will gently be gently tuned to its purpose and use. The universe will serve it gladly as it serves the universe but do not interfere. The power set in you, whom the Holy Spirit's goal has been established, is so far beyond your little conception of the infinite that you have no idea how great the strength that goes with you. And you can use this in perfect safety. Yet for all its might, so great it reaches past the stars and to the universe that lies beyond them, your little faithlessness can make it useless if you would use the faithlessness instead. Yet think on this and learn the cause of faithlessness. You think you hold against your brother what he has done to you, but you really blame him, but what you really blame him for is what you did to him. It is not his past, but yours you hold against him. And you lack faith in him because of what you were. Yet you are not as innocent of what you were as he is. 
what never was is causeless and is not there to interfere with truth. There is no cause for faithlessness, but there is cause for faith. That cause has entered any situation that shares its purpose. The light of truth shines from the center of the situation and touches everyone to whom the situation's purpose calls. It calls to everyone. There is no situation that does not involve your whole relationship. In every aspect and complete in every part. You can leave nothing of yourself outside it and keep the situation holy, for it shares the purpose of your whole relationship and derives its meaning from it. Each situation with the faith you give your brother or you are faithless to your own relationship. I'm sorry, let me read that sentence again. I don't think I did it right. Enter each situation with the faith you give your brother, or you are faithless to your own relationship. Your faith will call the others to share your purpose, as the same purpose called forth the faith in you. And you will see the means you once employed to lead you to illusions transformed to means for truth. When the Holy Spirit changed the purpose of your relationship by exchanging yours for his, the goal he placed there was extended to every situation in which you enter or will ever enter. And every situation was thus made free of the past which would have made it purposeless. You call for faith because of him who walks with you in every situation. You are no longer wholly insane, nor no longer alone. For loneliness in God must be a dream. You whose relationship shares the Holy Spirit's goal are set apart from loneliness because the truth has come. Its call for faith is strong. Use not your faithlessness against it, for it calls you to salvation and to peace. Chapter 17, Forgiveness and the Holy Relationship, Section 8, The Conditions of Peace. The holy instant is nothing more than a special case or an extreme example of what every situation is meant to be. The meaning that the Holy Spirit's purpose has given it is also given to every situation. It calls forth just the same suspension of faithlessness withheld and left unused that faith might call to the, that, I'm sorry, that faith might answer to the call of truth. The holy instant is the shining example, the clear and unequivocal demonstration of the meaning of every relationship and every situation seen as a whole. Faith has accepted every aspect of the situation and faithlessness has not forced any exclusion on it. It is a situation of perfect peace simply because you have let it be what it is. This simple courtesy is all the Holy Spirit asks of you. Let truth be what it is. Do not intrude upon it. Do not attack it. Do not interrupt its coming. Let it encompass every situation and bring you peace. Not even faith is asked of you, for truth asks nothing. Let it enter, and it will call forth and secure for you the faith you need for peace. But rise you not against it, for against your opposition it cannot come. Would you not make a holy instant of every situation? For such is the gift of faith, freely given whenever faithlessness is laid aside, unused. And then the power of the Holy Spirit's purpose is to free, is free to use instead. 
this power instantly transforms all situations into one sure and continuous means for establishing his purpose and demonstrating its reality. What has been demonstrated has called for faith and has been given it. Now it becomes a fact from which faith can no longer be withheld. The strain of refusing faith to truth is enormous and far greater than you realize. But to answer truth with faith entails no strain at all. To you who have acknowledged the call of your Redeemer, the strain of not responding to his call seems to be greater than before. This is not so. Before, the strain was there, but you attributed it to something else, believing that the something else produced it. This was never true, for what the something else produced was sorrow and depression, sickness and pain, darkness and dim imaginings of terror, cold fantasies of fear, and fiery dreams of hell. And it was nothing but the intolerable strain of refusing to give faith to truth and to see its evident reality. Such was the crucifixion of the Son of God. His faithlessness did this to him. Think carefully before you let yourself use faithlessness against him. For he is risen and you have accepted the cause of his awakening as yours. You have assumed your part in his redemption and you are now fully responsible to him. Fail him not now, for it has been given to you to realize that your lack of faith in him must mean to you. His salvation is your only purpose. See only this in every situation, and it will be a means for bringing only this. When you accepted truth as the goal for your relationship, you became a giver of peace as surely as your father gave peace to you. For the goal of peace cannot be accepted apart from its conditions and you had faith in it, for no one accepts what he does not believe is real. Your purpose has not changed and will not change, for you accepted what can never change, and nothing that it needs to be forever changeless can you now withhold from it. Your release is certain. Give as you have received, and demonstrate that you have risen far beyond any situation that could hold you back and keep you separate from him whose call you answered. End of chapter. Well, I hope you have a good time with this chapter. Uh, and I will see you here next Sunday for the next installment of the main text. We'll be reading chapter 18. Thank you so much for joining me today. Namaste and much love.